Did you know that Rust has an operator overloading concept that is very similar to Python's? And did you know that this concept actually makes a lot of sense? But what actually are operators? What is operator overloading? How does Rust do it? And why and when should we really use it? Huh. Seems as if we had to go over a few concepts here. So let's get right into it. Operators are characters or symbols that we assign specific meanings and rules to. And the most common operators we can encounter are the ones we probably all know from math. The plus sign, for example, marks an addition for which the second number is added to the first one. The minus or dash marks a subtraction for which the second number is subtracted from the first one and so on. One important thing about operators is that we always have to look at them in the specific context we encounter them. Adding two integers, for example, has some slightly different rules than adding two vectors. But that context sensitivity probably becomes more apparent if we take a look at the multiplication, which is usually represented with either a dot or an x, depending on where we live. For now, let's go with the dot for the multiplication, though. If we encounter a dot between two numbers, we multiply the first number by the second one. But if we encounter a dot between two vectors, the rules suddenly become very different. In that case, we talk about a so-called dot product. For a dot product, the individual components of the first vector are multiplied with their respective counterparts. And then each intermediate result is added together, which then results in a scalar and no longer a vector. We can find another example of different meanings of operators in different contexts in programming. Here, adding two numbers works like we are used to from math, but adding two strings results in a concatenation, which in return results in a new string that contains all the characters from the original two ones. If we quickly summarize all that, we get the following. First, operators are characters or symbols. Second, These operators can get a specific meaning and different rules for working with them. And third, the same operator can have a different meaning and different rules in different contexts. Now that we know what operators are, we should take a look at their use in programming. As we have already implicitly covered with our small string example, most programming languages have operators built into the language. These languages usually have at least operators for basic math, and most of them also make some usable with other types, like strings. Integrating these operators into a programming language even makes a lot of sense. If we do math, why not make the concepts we already know usable? Doing basic math with function calls also works, but it's not as easy to identify when reading code as doing them with the operators we already know. Some languages then go one step further and allow us to overload these operators. This operator overloading is a case of ad hoc polymorphism, which allows us to give new meaning to operators based on their arguments. Yeah. Sounds complicated, but what that actually means is the following. We can view any usage of an operator like a function call. If we take the addition as an example again, we can view a plus b as a form of calling the function with the symbol plus, on a variable a, which takes the variable b as its argument. And if that function call works for variables of type, let's say integer, the creators of the language must somehow have implemented code, which allows us to make use of that operator with variables of type integer. If a language now supports operator overloading, the creators of that language have also implemented concepts for users to use within their own code which then allows them to implement logic for specific types to work with specific operators. How far different languages go is varying, though. Some languages like Scala allow us to freely define operators and even create our own, and other languages only allow to overload a specific set of predefined operators. C++, for example, has a special syntax to overload a well-defined set of symbols as operators. That syntax even contains the word operator as a keyword to mark explicitly what's happening. Python, as another example, uses a protocol-based approach with special functions. The language also contains a well-defined set of operators that can be overloaded and expects special functions with two leading and trailing underscores each. 
Whenever the interpreter then encounters an operator at runtime, it calls the corresponding special function, which implements the operation under the hood. This concept is actually very similar to Rust's, so it's probably about time that we finally take a look at how Rust handles operator overloading. A cornerstone of abstraction in Rust is traits, and a lot of the language's functionality is based on them. Whether it's about simple generalization, method and function call dispatching, marking specific behaviors, closures, and more. Operator overloading in Rust is thus also based on traits, because why change a system that already works well? The standard library offers a wide array of traits related to operator overloading in the STDOps module, and they are the user interface that allows us, as developers, to make specific operators usable with custom types. As the system is based on traits, it's already implied that we can't justify any symbol as an operator. The list of traits and thus overloadable operators is just finite. But gladly, that list covers all the important operators that we probably already know and are used to. One great thing about Rust's system is that by putting this feature behind traits, it becomes pretty transparent which type overloads which operators. It's way easier to look up the traits a type implements than to find out which methods it defines. In Rust, we are allowed to overload operators like the plus and minus sign, the asterisk, which is usually associated with the multiplication, and the slash as the usual division operator, and also operators known from bitwise operations, like the ampersand and the pipe. Additionally, we can also overload some combined operators, like plus or asterisk together with the equal sign. In general, we can overload nearly all operators we can usually encounter in any Rust code when working with primitives and select structures like strings. Overloading an operator requires us to implement the corresponding trait for a type, but we can't freely do that for any type because Rust's orphan rules still apply. These rules state that we can only implement a trait for a type if either the trait or the type is within our own crate, so no operator overloading for types from external crates. Okay, let's now look at a small example of operator overloading by quickly implementing our own custom struct, a 3D vector in this case. That vector consists of three components specifying its position within the three-dimensional space. An X, a Y, and a Z component. When we now want to do some math with our custom vector, we could overload at least a few operators for it. We can, for example, overload the plus operator by implementing the add trait for our vector. The trait itself defines an associated type, which marks the output. For our vector, output should be self because adding two vectors results in a new vector. Implementing the add method then is super straightforward. We just need to create a new vector, adding the x components together, then the y components, and then the z components. We can also implement the add assign trait for our vector, if we want to allow the usage of the addition assignment with our type, so plus equals also becomes a usable operation for us. These traits can also do a little more, because some of them have an associated type, and if the trait at hand has one, we can additionally modify the return type of the operation. Remember that dot product example from earlier? Multiplying two vectors actually results in a scalar, and not another vector. We can model that by implementing the mal trait for our vector. Its associated type should be some kind of number, an i64 in this case, and the body of the method contains the math necessary to calculate the result, which is a single number. But there's even more. Most of these traits are actually generic, which means that we can alter the input argument that normally defaults to the self type. Our vector can also be multiplied by a scalar, for example. And to make this work, we need to implement the mal trait for it, again. But this time we implement mal with the generic type parameter i64 for our vector. The output type is self again, and within the body of the method, we implement the necessary math. There is one catch, however. All operator arguments are positional, which means that right now we have only implemented the operation multiply a vector 3D by an i64. So vector 3D asterisk i64 works, but not the other way. If we want to allow the usage of the operation multiply an i64 by a vector 3D or i64 asterisk vector 3D, 
we need to implement mal once again. Now we have to implement mal with the generic type parameter vector3d for i64. The output type is vector3d in that case, and the body of the function is just the opposite of the body of the other way of the operation. Because this time self is an i64, and the argument is our vector. After this, we can freely swap the position of the variables in our multiplication. We can now also quickly implement the mal assign trade, which allows us to use the combined operator asterisk and equals. But that's it then for the multiplication. Or huh. is it? Well, not completely, because there is one more multiplication-like operation for vectors, the cross product. And unlike the dot product, it results in a new vector. But if we now try to think about implementing it, we will probably soon realize that we've actually hit a wall. Our implementation of the mal trade for our vector is already assigned to the dot product, and Rust doesn't have another symbol that is usually associated with the multiplication. So, what now? Well, this issue shows a limitation in Rust and also other languages regarding operator overloading that actually makes sense. Reading code is a difficult task. Depending on our experience, we sometimes understand code we see faster and sometimes slower. In the end, we are all used to a certain style of code, how we name variables, how things are ordered, and so on. We are, of course, also used to some operators and their specific meanings, because most of us had quite a few years in school learning math next to other subjects, and we have hopefully encountered them often when reading and writing code. If we take another look at our implementation of the dot product, we should probably ask ourselves an honest question. Will someone reading code which involves our vector3d type and the usage of our overloaded asterisk operator really understand that they are actually seeing the calculation of a dot product without having to take a look at the documentation of that operator that we have hopefully written? If we are honest, the answer is probably no. The answer is probably even more a no if we are honest again and admit that the asterisk is neither a dot nor an x which are the usual symbols used for the dot and the cross product in math. In this particular case, it's probably better to even remove the operator overload for the multiplication and replace it with a function that has a fitting name, dot product. The same goes for the cross product. We should give it its own method and call it according to what it does, cross product. Yes, an operator is easier to use because it's just a single symbol and not a function call although under the hood it still is. But as soon as we encounter ambiguity, like in this example, we should refrain from overloading an operator just for the sake of it. On the other hand, if everyone we work with usually agrees on which one of multiple ambitious operators should be associated with a specific operation, we can also just go ahead and implement one. In general, however, we should think about readability and context. Overloading operators for the sake of it will just create barely readable code, and that should never be the goal. Where appropriate, however, operators can also improve code readability. Limiting the range of possible operators to overload is also a wise choice by Rust in other languages. Just imagine unknown symbols popping up left and right within code. Would that increase readability? Probably not. And thus, sometimes it's wise to put bounds on certain things to prevent people from harming others, including themselves. And this is exactly what Rust, for example, does. Overall, Rust's system really makes sense. On one hand, it prevents uncontrolled spawns of unknown symbols used as operators left and right. On the other hand, it creates transparency through the use of traits, which is a common concept in Rust. So nothing new for Rust developers to learn. There also might be better concepts out there, but Rust could also have made a worse choice, so I think that's a win already. But that's it for this video now, so enjoy your newly gained knowledge, and until then, see you in the next video.